Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our global audience. Thank you for joining us today. I am Sarah Basiri, Helios Spectra's VP of Global Marketing, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on the topic of using light to regulate the quality of greenhouse grown crops. Before we get started, I would like to give a quick intro into Helios Spectra and go over some housekeeping items. Many don't know that Helios Special was actually founded 14 years ago in Sweden by plant scientists and biologists with one vision, and that was to make crop production more intelligent and resource efficient. Today, with customers across six continents, Helios Spectra is the global leader in innovative horticulture lighting, as well as controlled light systems and specialized services for greenhouses and controlled plant growth environments. Be sure to check out heliospectra.com right after this webinar to learn more about us. Check out our Grower Center where we have tons of eBooks, articles, blogs, and infographics, as well as our past webinars where you can view on demand. Now onto our housekeeping items. Be sure to enter all your questions and comments in the questions panel. We have allocated 20 minutes at the end of this webinar to discuss your questions. If we don't get to them and we run out of time, one of us will reach out to you directly by email. This webinar will be recorded and a link will be emailed to you as well within the next 24 hours. We have also included our social media channels on that email where we'll continue the discussion from this webinar, so be sure to be on the lookout. And now for the moment everyone has been waiting for, I would like to introduce you to our moderator our very own plant and light expert, Ida Falström, who will be leading the discussion with our wonderful speaker, joining us from the Department of Biosystems and Technology from SLU, Dr. Carl Johan Bergstand. I will be back in 40 minutes to get started with the Q&A portion of the webinar. Over to you, Ida. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. My name is Ida Falström, and I'm a plant and light expert at Halo Spectra. My work at Halo Spectra is evolving understanding how plants respond to light with respect to light quality, intensity, and photo period. I investigate the best application for lighting on numerous crops during the different growth stages. This work I do close with my team at Halo Spectra and together with our collaboration partners, research partners, and our customers. And for me, being based in Sweden and with a great interest I have in lighting for plants, it gives me a great pleasure to finally have one of Sweden's leading horticultural research joining our webinar series. Uh, I would like to leave uh, the floor open for Dr. Carl Johan Bergstrand. Please, Carl Johan, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see if I can. Ah. No, hmm. we need to share the screen. Let's see. There's always something, right? Do Technology. Need, yeah, do you need to give me the right to share the screen again? Let's see. I think that Sarah or can maybe arrange so call you one can be presenter. Apologize. Obviously, there's always an issue with the digital world. I am actually trying, but it is uh, giving me some trouble here. Ida, if I make you presenter, are you able to see it? No? Uh, no. Okay, I think it's popping up now. Yeah, now I see it. Excellent. Apologies for that. Now it's so perfect. Can, yeah, thank you. So welcome to this webinar with the title Using Light to Regulate the Quality of Greenhouse Crops. And my name is Kolya Weistan, as mentioned. I have a background in greenhouse horticulture and uh, in 2003, I took my university diploma in horticultural management. In 2006, I became a bachelor in biology. In 2010, I got a PhD in horticulture. And since 2017, I'm an associate professor in horticulture. 
my main research interest are the use of artificial lights in horticulture, climate control in greenhouses, growth regulation, plant nutrition, organic production, hydroponics, plant factories, and so on. So it's uh, quite broad areas, but I would say that the artificial light and the LED lights has been my main focus for the last 10 years. So why do we use artificial light in horticulture? Well, we use it, of course, to drive the photosynthesis. We want to grow the air around, also, it's, for example, here in Scandinavia. And we want to prolong the, the season, the summer season. We want to start, especially we want to start earlier in the year, already in January, perhaps. Uh, the light also helps us to increase the transpiration and decrease leaf moisture. Those are also important factors to have a healthy crop. We use the light as photoperiodic light to regulate the flowering and morphology of plants, especially ornamental plants. And we use lights for cultivation in growth chambers, so-called plant factories, where we have no natural light. And that is really an emergency, an emerging, emerging area, which is rapidly increasing at the moment. So the involvement of light control before the 1930s, we could only use shading or whitewashing of greenhouses. That was the only sort of rude control of the light environment that we had. Uh, from the 1930s onwards, uh, we started using the supplemental light. From the 1950s, we started controlling the photo period, both with the uh, artificial light and also with using blackout screens. And from around 2010, the LEDs started to be introduced. So at that time, we could also control the spectrum of quality of the, the light inside the greenhouse. So the first technology that was used for greenhouse lighting was uh, incandescent lamps, which uh, were tested here at my university, as you can see in the picture here, already in the 1930s. And that was actually quite successful, as, with, as they said at that time, of course, I think the main effect was higher leaf temperature from the strong infrared radiation from these incandescent lamps. But uh, it showed the potential of artificial lighting in greenhouses. <laughs> and then came the mercury lamps. They were introduced in the 1950s, and they were quite simple and uh, quite cheap. And, especially this version, as you can see here in the picture, where the reflector was integrated in the bulb. And uh, they were used both for, uh, for photoperiodic control and for, for uh, photosynthetic lighting. So that was the sort of breakthrough of artificial lights in greenhouses, Espe mainly used for ornamental crops at that time, at least in Northern Europe, that was the cash crops at the time carnations, roses, and so on, many different types of ornamental plants. And then in the 1970s, the high-pressure sodium lamps were introduced, and they were significantly more efficient than the lamp types that we used previously. And they are still quite dominating today, actually, but they have reached the end of their developmental uh, potential. So they are not really developing anymore now. They have been developing until around 10 years ago. They were increasing their efficiency, but now they reached the end of the, or the top of their potential. And this is a typical installation in uh, ornamental plants, poinsettia, but they are also, of course, widely used for year-round production of tomatoes, cucumbers, etc. But around 10 years ago, interesting things start, started to happen. And of course, I'm talking about the LED lights. Uh, they have been introduced. The LED was invented already around 100 years ago, actually, but was not commercially introduced until the 1960s. And it was only around 15 years ago that high intensity LEDs were introduced, which made it possible to, uh, to use artificial light in greenhouses. And uh, the LED light has uh, certain uh, <clears throat> it has certain uh, 
It has a positive uh, things. It's, you can use the narrow band light, uh, for example, um, only red, only blue light, as you can see in the picture, or only green light. It has a flexible construction when it comes to light fixtures. Uh, you can design the light fixtures in very many different ways, and it also has uh, high efficiency, high electric. It, it converts the electricity to photons at a high rate. And especially the narrow band light is interesting from a plant physiology perspective. We can use the narrow band light to control plant reactions in different ways. So the visible parts of the light spectrum is uh, a quite narrow part of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. And the visible spectrum of the light is more or less the same as the plants can use for their photosynthesis. And then plants can also use UV light and infrared lights for controlling different types of uh, reactions. So the plant has uh, various light sensors. It has uh, phytochromes, for example, and cryptochromes, which uh, mainly are affected by uh, red light and blue light. And then there are also hypothetical sensors for UV light and for the green light. And those are hypothetical in the sense that we know that they exist. They must exist because we can see it from the plant reactions, but they have not been identified biochemically so far, so we have not found them yet. So can we use the light to control the quality of our produce in our greenhouses? Well, the end product, it equals genotype times environment. So the genotype of our plant and the environment in which the plant grows. So here, of course, we focus on the environment. And one important part of the environment is the light. So to control the internal quality, the light will affect uh, the contents of, for example, carbohydrates, of course, the primary, primary result of the photosynthesis. It will affect the contents of nitrate in the leaves, the content of vitamins, and flavor and taste of the produce. And uh, mainly uh, phenolic compounds are responsible for the flavor and the taste of the produce. And also the external quality <clears throat> can be affected by the light, for example, plant morphology and uh, plant color, that is pigmentation. So that applies both to edible crops and, of course, especially to ornamental crops. So we're getting back to our spectrum here. Uh, it ranges from the blue light to the red light, the visible spectrum, and it's more or less the same as is used by the, by the plants for photosynthesis. But in this context of controlling quality, especially the short wavelengths, like the blue light and the UV light, as well as the far red light are interesting. And the far red light is just at the end of the visible spectrum, and in between the visible spectrum and the infrared spectrum. And so that is very important for, for plant reactions because it tells the plants something about its environment. If the plant is shaded by another plant, another leaf, the light that is filtered through this leaf will be depleted of red lights and where, whereas the far red light is still there. So it will have a an altered uh, red to far red ratio as compared to the solar sunlight, and that will cause the shade avoidance response in the plant, so there is a strong elongation <coughs> from the plants, because the plants then want to avoid, avoid the shade, and they start to have an excessive elongation in order to get out of the shade. So now we come to the materials and methods part of the 
experiments that I want to share with you here. Uh, and the first experiment I'm presenting is one we used where well, we used ornamental plants like petunia, pelargonium, and poinsettia, and they were cultivated in a growth chamber or in the greenhouse. So we used uh, LEDs in a growth chamber. We had no natural light, only artificial lights, and we used white, yellow, red, green, or blue LEDs. So those are very basic experiments. That was the first experiments we did around 12 years ago when we started using the LEDs here. I worked at that time together with my colleague, Hartmut Kjöschyslo, who you can see who took the picture. He's uh, now retired since quite many years, actually. And we could see here, especially if we look at the petunia at the top, we can see that uh, we had very strong effects when we used the different light qualities. Uh, it, uh, the light quality affected the elongation of the stems, it affected the size of the leaves, the color of the leaves, and it affected the, um, the flower induction. As you can also see only the white, the light plants, which get the white and the blue light, uh, induced flowers in this long day plant. So this was sort of uh, very inspiring to see that the light could have such strong influence on the plant growth and plant morphology. So uh, we continued working from that point. So we moved into the greenhouse because still most of the plant production takes place in greenhouses. We use the natural light and then we also have artificial light as a com complementary light source. Uh, so we tried to introduce uh, artificial light as a supplementary light source. We used the white LEDs to the left, the combination of red and blue LEDs in the middle, and the traditional high pressure sodium lamps to the right. And at this time, around 10 years ago, there was a strong belief that the red and blue LEDs were the most, that red and blue light was the most important. So many light LED light fixtures in the market was composed of only red and blue LEDs. Uh, LED light in general is quite rich in blue light and has little far red light, uh, whereas the high pressure sodium is quite low in blue and moderate in far red light. So we can see here that the red and blue LEDs, they had a reduced elongation as compared to uh, the high pressure sodium lamp. But actually the fresh weight was, or the biomass production was also a little bit lower with the LEDs here. And that's also partly a temperature effect because the high pressure sodium lamp, it emits uh, a lot of infrared light, which of course heats, uh, heat up the leaves. So that, uh, uh, which also triggers growth and of course elongation. <clears throat> So this is not, not just an effect of the light spectrum, but also a temperature effect, the effects that we can see here. But when it comes to ornamental plants, we would like to have a compact plant. So we don't want excessive growth. So we, we were happy here that we could find a light source that could uh, reduce elongation and thereby the need for chemical growth uh, retardants or plant growth regulators. Uh, and it's also, of course, a matter of red to blue, blue red to oh, what happened now? Something happened. Ah, we're back. And also a temperature effect, as I mentioned. 
In another experiment, we used a narrow band light uh, as a supplement, supplement to uh, natural light. Uh, we used very low light intensities, only 20 micromoles per square meter per second. And in combination with natural light, of course, we were working in the greenhouse. So 20 micromoles per square meter per second, that's very little light. It's, uh, so we only get a few percent of the total of light, daily light integral from the LEDs in this case. So we have from left, no addition, so only natural light. And then we added white light, red light at 660 nanometers, red light 620 nanometers, and blue light, uh, that is 460 nanometers. <coughs> uh, so we can see that the red light here, it's actually the 660 nanometers. It's reduced uh, stair elongation significantly. And that is, of course, because uh, the effects on the red to far red ratio. So adding more red light, it reduces uh, or increases the red to far red ratio, which reduces the stain elongation. So that was also a positive result. And then we used a combination of narrow band light and short photoperiod to control elongation. We used a light scheme where we had uh, only eight hours of natural light so we used the blackout screens we had a period in the morning of two hours of 620 nanometers light during the day during the eight hours of natural light we also added 30 micromoles per square meter and second of 660 nanometers and at the end of the photo period we had a period of green light at 20 micromoles per square meter and second for two hours so a total photo period of uh, 12 hours, out of which four was just LED, eight was natural light in combination with LEDs, and then we had uh, 12 hours of light of darkness. So this is was was the result for the algorithm. We compared it with the chemical growth regulation, so natural photoperiod and chemical growth regulation, or no growth regulation. So we can see here that this light uh, treatment had a very strong effect on the elongation of the plants. We get a very compact and bushy plant. However, it was also delayed a little bit in development. You can see here that the flowering was a little bit delayed as compared to the lights that the plants that received uh, natural photoperiod. So. Now we get, go over to the control of the internal quality of the plant. So then, of course, we are talking about uh, edible plants, where we are interested in the flavor, the taste, and perhaps also the content of nutrients. So we did ex an experiment where we had uh, where we used different light spectrum. We are still in the greenhouse, but early, late in the autumn, where we had very little natural light. So the the Artificial light accounted for most of the lights that the plants uh, got. We had, uh, and here of course we used the heliospectra, uh, heliospectra fixtures. We, we had one spectrum which was called the growth spectrum, uh, with a lot of red light in it. Uh, we had one uh, treatment where we added a few days of an end of production light where we had added UV light at the end of the production cycle. Uh, one treatment where we had a uh, one week at the end of the production cycle with very high light, 500 micromoles per square meter and second, if I remember correctly. Uh, the normal growth light was 200 micromoles per square meter and second. We had one spectrum with high, which was very high in blue light. And then we had also for comparison the traditional high pressure sodium lamps. And uh, we grow the herbs, lettuce, and uh, dill and basil. And the temperature was the regular greenhouse climate, so 18 to 20 degrees, and on sunny days up to around 25 degrees air temperature. We had natural lights for uh, 10 hours per day, and the supplemental light at 200 micromoles per square meter a second for 16 hours per day. So this is uh, 
just a view from the research greenhouse here at our campus and what it looked like in the experimental uh, setup. We analyzed uh, phenolic compounds in the plants. We analyzed aromas, uh, so-called sniff tests, and also uh, some of these compounds was identified using mass spectrometry, mass spectrometry. And of course, we also analyzed growth, that is the biomass production. <coughs> so the results from lettuce, it had a very strong effect on the pigmentation of the lettuce. This was a red leaf uh, variety, which is tricky to grow in a greenhouse. That's a normal problem when growing lettuce in the greenhouse, that the red leaf varieties, they, they don't get red. And that is because the greenhouse environment is normally lacking in UV light, which is also, as is also the high pressure sodium lamp, which we can see here that the high pressure sodium lamp, almost no coloration here, then the plants were green. The white and red LEDs also, so that is the growth spectrum, so to say, was called in the previous slide. Uh, also not so much coloration, but if we added UV or high blue or had a very high light intensity, then the pigmentation of the, leaf, of the leaves was uh, stronger. So we see that we can control the coloration of the leaves to a very high extent using the light spectrum. But there was a higher biomass production with a high pressure sodium, mainly due to the higher leaf temperature and less production of shading pigments in the leaves. And we get more aroma with the blue light. That does not necessarily mean that uh, the lettuce tasted better, but it had more aroma, more aroma compounds. Uh, and of course, this the LED lights that we use here that were not really optimized to uh, or designed to optimize growth, but to optimize the production of secondary metabolites in the plants. That is, aroma compounds, pigments, etc. So that also explains the, that the biomass production was high with high pressure sodium in this experiment. And uh, the concentration of of aromas was lower in the plants grown with high pressure sodium, mainly due to a dilution because the leaf expansion was faster due to the higher leaf temperature and due to more, more far red light in the spectrum than we had in the spectra with LEDs. So for deal and basil, uh, the content of phenolic compounds, so that is uh, taste was the highest in the plants that received the UV light and the blue light. The higher light intensity gave higher contents of vitamin C in the plants. And uh, the basil, but not the deal, had a higher biomass uh, production with high pressure sodium lamps. And that is probably due to that these plants have different temperature optima. So basil has a very high temperature optima, so it thrived in the strong radiant heat from the high pressure sodium lamp. But whereas the dill has a lower uh, temperature optimum and was obviously stressed from the, from the heat load from the high pressure sodium lamps. So this is just uh, an example of uh, some different compounds that were uh, characterized with the sniff test. And then uh, we measured with the high, with a high pressure sodium with, with um, HPLC, the amount of the, the compounds that were uh, present in the plant. So we can see that there were, were some differences. We could find a few compounds that were significantly different between the different treatments. But time doesn't allow me to go very deep into that in this webinar. So it's just uh, to show an example of what it looked like. So some conclusions from the results. Narrow band light, especially the red light, so the 616 nanometer controls the stem elongation to a high extent. 
uh, also blue light, 450 nanometers. It controls mainly the inner quality, so the production of phenolic compounds and aromas in the plants. And temperature is, of course, always an important factor. <clears throat> so, some sort of outlook. What kind of production systems will the advancements in artificial lighting bring us in the future? Well, I think we're looking much more at production of high quality vegetables and herbs in plant factories. And a plant factory is a vertical farm, normally a vertical or multi layer farm with no natural light. All the lights is supplied with artificial light. Uh, and I think that is uh, something that will be more for the future. And it's already, we already see now that many plant factories, commercial plant factories are established, uh, not the least here in Sweden and also in many other countries. Uh, at this moment, they are mainly producing lettuce and herbs, but I think that they will expand into other, also in other crops in the near future. You can use vertical farming with natural light in combi combination with natural light, as in this example, where you have the uh, transparent facade and utilize uh, the natural light as much as possible. And of course, you are also relying on artificial light in these types of systems. You can produce drugs, vaccines, or cuttings in plant factories. That is also a very interesting area of production, I think, where you can have very high hygiene and control the quality of the plants with very high accuracy, which is, of course, important when you're, for example, producing medical drugs. So my prediction at this day is actually that in 100 years from now, or even less, all vegetables that are fresh, freshly consumed by humans will be, will be produced indoors, in plant factories or in other highly controlled systems, so using artificial lighting. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Carl Yuan, for the great presentation. Thank you. Let's see if I can join in here. So here yeah. I am. Yeah. <laughs> I'm back. Hey, everyone. So thank you, Carl Yuan, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to, before we let our audience in with questions, I would like to have some, take the opportunity to have some questions myself first. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in one of the first slides you show, you showed uh, actually one of our first generation uh, flexible lights, it's called L4A, uh, the big one. Uh, but I'm, I'm actually curious, I mean, uh, um, as we've seen, you, you've been working uh, extendedly over a long period of time with, with uh, looking on light and its meaning it has for plant production. So for you as a researcher, uh, how important is it for you to be able to uh, work uh, work with a flexible light to be able to tune um, to decide what kind of light that you should give the plants? That means today you showed us where you have been giving static light, you showed us end of production, you showed us where you altering over um, the the day where you have a certain amount of like blue light in the morning, and then you had some green light. How important is that for you as a researcher to be able to do that with the lights? Yeah, that is inevitable, of course, and uh, I was very happy when I found a new Spectras products. At first, I actually tried to design some fixtures on my own, and I had them built in China, and uh, they, they worked okay. I used them for some experiments, but uh, they were quite, they didn't give, produce a strong light and so on. But then I, I got into contact with Helios Spectra, and I got to try one of your first, this L4A, the first ones I got were more or less prototypes, I think. So I was very happy with the with the interface. They were easy to use, and uh, and I could finally do the type of experiments that I wanted to do all along. That's great. Happy to hear. Uh, happy to hear that it's working well for you to use them. Um, and also looking at looking on lights. I mean, you. You, as mean, as well as um, me, we've been reading a lot about lights, and we have been looking on in the past how how we, people been looking up on lights, how we've been working with it previously before the LEDs. It was um, you use high pressure sodium lights, and you try to use filters and these kind of things. So a lot of things that was kind of stated as truth before it usually is revisited 
uh, after some time in, in the research community. But one of the things actually that stands out, at least for me uh, in your career, is that uh, you quite early on uh, catch on the benefits of green light for plants. Uh, but how would you say, and uh, well, your experience, uh, how it, the view on green light have been changing since you started working with lighting for crops? It has changed very much at that time. Uh, where, where at the time when I started working on light, the main view was that the green light was not useful to plants at all. And I often got some questions at symposia and so on, why do you use the green light? And people were sort of thinking I was crazy for using the green light because everyone knows it's not useful. Uh, but now I think everyone is aware of the importance of, of green lights, especially for the that the green light has good penetration in the canopy and contributes to the to the photosynthesis, especially in the uh, lower leaves. And we also know that today that there is a great green light sensor in the plants, so that it triggers different physiological responses in the plants. So I think most uh, scientists, at least, are uh, agree today that the green light is more or less necessary for the plants. But still, we still see some uh, cheaper LED light fixtures in the market, which consist of, of just red and blue lights, actually. And there is still a debate, for example, in different uh, discussion rooms on the internet, for example, around these things. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, um... As you, you, as you know, uh, also also a strong believer of the green light, so I'm just happy to see that that is shifting towards um, where we've been standing. But it's interesting, actually, as you say, just the view on it, how it's actually been shifting from not used at all till actually how important and how big of a function it has and important for crops and how useful it is actually for crop uh, in crop production, at least to my opinion. Um, so. But looking at it, what would you say is um, the, the kind of like the, the most benefit of working with with the flexible light with, for crop production, out of as like a research perspective, but also at a commercial perspective, like for for a grower, for instance, can you see an can you see a usage for using LED lights in the way that you've done, but in a bigger commercial scale? Yeah, definitely, you can use the the, the lights to optimize the production, both with respect to uh, integration of artificial light and natural light, of course, to optimize photosynthesis and also uh, to control the quality. As I have shown in my slides today, it's, it's not fiction anymore, it's, it's reality now. And, uh, the products are available in the market, so it's for the growers, they can just start applying this knowledge here in the farms. Yeah, it, it's amazing, <laughs> but I don't have to tell you. <laughs> that you're in but um so i think that um i should i mean, I, I want to ask more but i should i should do at least this once so i know that i'm not certain that i have had the time to uh, to ask you ask you this before i mean as you mentioned in the beginning you have a lot of research area of your interest i mean it's actually extended list of knowledge you have called one so one thing i'm really curious about is that what what is next for you? What is the, what is the next thing you're going to research? What kind of research projects are you working on currently? Well, I'm very happy to currently be involved in a research project uh, together with uh, Heliospectra and also Shalmos Technical Institute, uh, where we look at uh, the use of uh, in the integration of sensors into the light system, so we can use uh, LED lights in combination with certain sensors for detection of plant stress, for example. Uh, Draft stress or attacks of pests and pathogens on the plants. So that's a very interesting area, and we're actually running experiments right now as we speak. The experiments are running here at our lab, so that's very interesting. That's great. How, as you mentioned, that was also quite. There was a huge project with many people collaborating. How important is it for you to be able to expand your project groups into into other areas as well? Um, than only than biology and plants. By I think the integration of technology and, uh, and biology is very interesting. I think well, that's where the most interesting things happen in the interface sort of between biology and technology. So it's very fruitful for me. I, I'm mainly at the biological side to get together with experts in technology. So uh, then we can really achieve something when we get together. Yeah. 
sounds great. I mean, it's uh, like I said, it, it sounds like a really interesting, interesting, uh, in, interesting partners with joining with Chalmers. And for you who don't, oh, maybe not everyone is familiar <laughs> with Chalmers, but but here in Sweden, it's a it's a really big university We're focusing a lot on on the technology part and the. So it, it's it's really interesting on in the engineering. Um, so sorry, I'm just looking at the time. <laughs> so I know that if I need to let it let in the audience. Um I'm just gonna check with with uh, our do I need to let the audience questions in or can I continue? Sarah joined us now. I think we have a couple more minutes, Ida. I think people are still entering in the question. Perfect. Then I will continue. <laughs> Don't mind if I do. Uh, so, um, Carl Yuan, you've also been looking quite much on the content in inside plants, as you say. What, what would you say is do you, is it most interesting? I mean, you showed us today what you can do on like morphology and the shape of the plant, and you can all, and you also showed us a bit about what you can do with the content inside the plant. For you personally, what what is the most interesting you think is to do? Well, I had very, a very big interest in the growth control of, of ornamental plants, but I think maybe the commercial value is perhaps even greater in controlling the internal quality because then we are talking about food stuff, and uh, we know the or we all know the importance of a healthy diet and so on. And actually, the LED technology can can help humanity to to have more healthy diets. So, so that is more. Uh, I think that is. The most interesting future perspective actually in this case yeah uh, yeah so where would you see that is the best way of implementing it do you think it's going to be uh, in the greenhouses or do you think it's going to be mainly for the for the indoor production of it as you mentioned in the end there where, where you think that it's going to be in, in more controlled environments but um, do you think it's going to be mainly indoors or do you think it's going to be greenhouses or a combination of both uh, yeah, I think mainly indoors in plant factories. Actually, we, we see now a couple of years ago, maybe I have said, would have said greenhouses, but now we see a very rapid development in plant factories, and uh, we know that they are very efficient today. If you compare, if you place, if you have one square meter of uh, land and you put a solar cell there, you can actually solar PV panels there and use this electricity to drive a plant factory. You can actually have a much higher production of inside this plant factory than if you grew the vegetables directly in the field. So already there we see very that, that plant factories are important for supplying food to the growing population of the world. And of course it needs to be high quality. The demand for high quality food is mm. is rising all the time. It should be rich in energy and rich in, in vitamins and so on. And we also know that crops produced inside has has a much higher Hygienic quality, there's much less risk of food poisoning and so on as compared to crops grown out in the field. So there are multiple advantages of these production systems. So I think, as I said, in 100 years ago, there will be everywhere and mainly all our foods will be, be produced that way. And, and maybe it will not even last 100 years. It will only perhaps only be 25 years. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the the that has been rapidly kind of increasing over the years, as you mentioned. And what what how we were used to growing in field and in, and then moved into greenhouses now actually moving completely indoors. So it it's a the, the future is now sort of say like it, it's going rapidly. I mean, and uh, I also been working with um, uh, with LEDs for almost uh, for almost a decade now, and I know that you have been even longer working with it. So I mean, I think um, at least for how I see it, the the change of was was kind of like just a few people could be able to use for like 10 years ago now is actually it can be purchased by by growers or anyone who wants to do research or grow plants under artificial light is actually possible and i mean that's quite a rapid uh, time for just for just a decade uh, uh, it's a bunch of questions so if you don't uh, mind jump right in just want to make sure we cover i think a lot of people are now coming in with questions so we're going to try to get to as many as possible so this question actually applies to both of you guys i think you have both bring in different perspectives to this but um the question is does higher light intensity always equal higher biomass uh, not, not necessarily of course all other factors also need to be to be fulfilled, you mean, I mean, you need to have the proper climate for the plant, you need to supply enough water and enough 
nutrients and so on. So uh, if you're uh, familiar with the uh, Liebig's law of the minimum, you know that the, the, the climatic fact, there's always one climatic factor that is sort of limiting production. So if your uh, plants, if you have a shortage of a nutrient, for example, nitrogen, then it will not help to increase the light intensity. The plants will not grow more even how much you can increase the light and it might at some some point even reduce biomass growth because you cause the plant stress if you if you supply too much light and, and one and there are other factors missing so to say okay uh next question how does using led light compare to making full use of sunlight do you do any study regarding this matter? Uh, well, we, uh, if you use the LED lights, you can sort of optimize the spectrum and you can reduce some of the adverse effects that you might have actually from natural sunlight, such as high contents of UV light and uh, and a far red ratio that is might, might not be favorable for all crops that you produce or depending on what quality of the crop you will like to obtain. Uh, so uh, I think that, well, the natural, the solar light is not always the best. Sometimes you hear people claim that the plants have evolved under sunlight for millions of years, so sunlight must be the best for the plants. But actually, I don't agree. You can you can make things even better than sunlight with the LEDs. Yeah, yeah, and I was going to say, and sometimes plants have a natural way of growing, which for some reason is not attractive to us, which call you and just showed where a plant actually can grow really tall and it will do that. But we want to ensure that it's keeping compact. And that's also a way of working with light. So The next question, uh, Carl Johan, you have answered in certain ways, but um, the person's wondering, what are the effects of far red, blue light, red light and green light specific to tomato crops and i know either you probably have plans to share on that as well yeah so the far red light it will increase uh, stem elongation it will increase leaf expansion and it's also as we know today it contributes actually also to photosynthesis in, in some uh, to some extent uh, the green light uh, in a dense crop, uh, in, the, in the dense canopy, as you often have in a tomato crop, you have a very dense canopy. You have a leaf area index of around three. So you have that means you have three square meters of leaf area per square meter of ground area. So that's a very dense canopy. So that's why the green light is very important because it penetrates the canopy and, and activates the, the inner leaves or the, the, the lower leaves so that the whole canopy is active and producing assimilates. Anything else to add on that, Ida? No, I mean, you covered it very well, so no, nothing. Excellent. We do have an infographic on our website, if you're interested in downloading that, um, that explains all the different lights and what it does for the plant. So if you'd like more information, please um, do check out our grower center. Next question, can you explain short photo period versus long photo period and which crop would react better to the longer extended photo periods? Yeah, so maybe I should have explained that uh, clearer in the presentation. A short photo period is basically when the when the night is longer than the day and a long photo period is when the day is longer than the night. And the, the sensibility for that is different among plant species. Some plant species are almost not sensitive at all. Some plant species, like for example, Poinsettia and Calanchoe, they require short photo periods in order to induce flowers. Some plant species, like uh, Petunia, uh, Scabula, uh, yeah, many other ornamental plants, they require a long photo period in order to induce flowers and the critical day length where there's this shift between vegetative and and uh, generative growth takes place it's a little bit different for different plant species but normally between 12 and 13 hours and sometimes up to 14 hours of darkness per 24 hour cycle is required to to trigger these uh, changes in uh, 
in the plant response. And then we have many many crops that are day daylight neutral, so to say, that are not really affected by the photo period, the day or the length of the day, and that are that includes many uh, traditional vegetable crops like tomato and cucumber. They are not sensitive to this really. Excellent. Interesting question. What is your opinion the highest value LEDs can bring to a grower? Uh, oh, yeah, of course, it's the possibility to control uh, to control the produce. It's one important factor, and also the energy savings, of course. As of today, the LEDs are, I mean, around 30, 35 percent more efficient than the high pressure sodium. So for, for example, for plant factories where we are relying completely on artificial light, it's of course necessary to use the, the LED lights. It's, it cannot be economical to use any other type of light source. So that is the introduction of the LED lamps, the LED lights, it's a prerequisite for this, for the development and the involvement of, of plant factories, which is now sort of a new industry actually that is emerging. And that's all thanks to the development within lighting technology. Which is an interesting segue to a, a question, I think it's also maybe a comment that someone made. Um, isn't it an environmental concern to use artificial light for plant production, considering a conversion efficiency of light into biomass of less than 1%? Well, you might argue that, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can actually have a higher efficiency if you, if you have one square meter of land, farmland, you place a PV panel there and use the electricity to produce, to drive a plant factory, you might have a higher efficiency than if you grow the plants directly in this farmland. And that might sound uh, crazy, but that's for Swedish condition at least, that is, you can explain that because the PV panels, it, it extracts energy the year around, uh, every day, whereas if you grow plants in the field, you may they may only take up the sunlight efficiently for three months, more or less, from May to July or so. So the rest of the year, the sunlight is wasted. Whereas the PV panel, it uh, extracts the light uh, 365 days per year, and then the climatic conditions in the plant factory can be optimized. When you grow the plants outside, the conditions are never optimal. If you grow the plants in a plant factory, conditions are always optimal. So that will actually make the production in a plant factory many, many times more efficient than the open field production. So that's, I think that's actually a very wise use of electricity. Mm. Great point. Next question, would you give seedlings higher light intensity or lower intensity than more mature plants? Uh, lower light intensity than more mature plants. They don't require so high light intensity in general. Okay. Um, interesting question. What is your favorite crop to work with and why? Oh, do I have to choose one? <laughs> uh, well, I think I would go with poinsettia, actually. That is one crop I have worked a lot with. I think it's a very interesting crop. And it has, for example, this, it, it requires, it's a short day plant, it requires uh, the short foot period in order to induce flowers. And, uh, so that is a very interesting crop from a, from a production physiology point of view. So that's my favorite uh, experimental crop. That's poinsettias. What about yeah, you, Ida? Of me now, and now I'm just going to say to call you and also give you the challenge for with the growth regulators as well, right? Yeah. The points that out, yeah. So collects all 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 special interests. Uh, yeah. Of me, like I said, do I have to choose one? I mean, there's there's so many there's so many crops, and everyone has um, a kind of a, a different purpose. It it depends on if you're going to grow it for. Uh, for for fun or for anything else, I was gonna say, but I mean, I I we call you, and I also like to to look on short crop. Actually, one of the most interesting uh, 
um, interesting crop I've been growing is actually chrysanthemums, which is also a short day crop, and also been looking on how to regulate the, the heights of them. And then it's really satisfying and really interesting to work with because it's, uh, it, it responds quite differently. And then in the end, you also can look on the flowering time and these kind of things. It's, it's super interesting, to me at least. Okay, I think we're going to take one last question. Uh, what is the biggest difference between growing plants indoor and in a greenhouse? Uh, in, 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 indoor or in the greenhouse, that was the question. Yes. So uh, in the greenhouse, of course, you will also have the natural light, which will account for most parts of the light that you need, at least during summertime. So you have less possibilities of of uh, using the light to control the growth. That is the main difference, I would say. Okay, I think we have come to the end of our webinar. Um, I want to thank you, Carl Johan, on behalf of the Spectra and Ida as well for sharing your valuable insights with us today. Again, for those of you who joined in late, uh, my name is Sarah Basiri. I'm the VP of Marketing at Helio Spectra. We are recording this webinar and we'll be sending a link to the recording right after this. Um, well, you'll be receiving it within the next 24 hours. If we didn't get to your questions or if you have anything else that you'd like to ask Ida or Carl Johan, please do reply to the email and we'll make sure that we'll get back to you. We'll also include a link to our new food lighting ebook. We hope you enjoy that as well. Again, we appreciate your time and we hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.